Hello. Yeah, but he is unable to hear. So, sir, you are audible. नहीं उनका शायद गायब हो रहा है। Am I audible? Is there any problem with my? Hello. No, no, you are audible, sir. Please go ahead. I cannot hear Dr. Singh. Uh, is there any problem at my end, or is it at the your end? I don't know. <laughs> sure, problem at your end. We are problem. we are able to hear you. We. No, you put uh, off your video. Hello. Might... You switch off your video. Uh, उनको फोन करके बताइए मे बी दॉल्यूम ऑफ योर कंप्यूटर इज एट वेरी लो दैट्स वाई वी आर नॉट यू आर नॉट एबल टू हियर इट मे बी इन साइलेंट मोड यूर टू इंक्रीज इज नॉट स्पीकिंग फोन आई एम कॉलिंग हिम बट इज नॉट स्पीकिंग Try sending me text. Okay. Yes, sir. Daksha, we can we can hear you. You can you can go ahead. Ah, uh, maybe you just check the volume of your uh, computer, which may be uh, at uh, silent mode, and therefore you are not able to hear. But we are able to hear you. You go ahead. Okay, that that may be connectivity problem then. सर नमस्कार नमस्कार ठीक है सर नमस्कार हेलो हेलो यस यस बताइए यस सर यू आर ऑडिबल गो हेड ओके गुड मॉर्निंग एवरीबॉडी वेलकम टू दिस कंक्लूडिंग सेशन ऑफ गुड मॉर्निंग सर गुड मॉर्निंग नाउ आई आई स्टार्ट विथ अ ट्रिब्यूट टू प्रोफेसर वी एल चोपड़ा i would request dr barman to share this slide dr barman uh, we we start with a tribute to professor uh, vh chopra padma bhushan uh, who was one of our uh, founder trustees and the white chair 15 genetic congress trust he left us uh, in the midst of this pandemic on 18th april 2020 uh, he was the one who was the spirit behind uh, this uh, genetic congress trust and uh, dr swaminathan uh, sent a message that through this trust let us try to live the dream and visions of professor chopra Uh, uh today we have with us uh, honorable dr mahapatra director general icar indian council of agriculture research and secretary dare that is director uh, sorry direct secretary dare uh, and uh, he is also one of our trustees and he is representing from the trust side also uh i have great pleasure in introducing dr mahapatra uh who has been one of the founders of our rice genome project the other day you have heard dr kishor gaikwad uh, about the rice genome project dr mahapatra was instrumental in starting that project in fact the back libraries that you are talking he was the one who 
examined those libraries assigned to the chromosomes and brought them back here for sequencing. Uh, you are asking how we are doing that 11 chromosome backs and all that. So here is the person. He's also one of the persons uh, involved in developing the first marker-assisted rice variety, Usa Basmati, along with Dr. A.K. Singh. Uh, and I have a great pleasure in welcoming Dr. Mahapatra for this concluding session. Uh, similarly, Dr. A.K. Singh, the director, Indian Agriculture Research Institute, is another very well-known figure uh, in the whole of the country. I think there is nobody who has not tasted basmati rice, which is being bred by him. And that's why we are all having something uh, that has flowed out of his hand. Uh, he's an outstanding teacher and a great researcher who has developed again, not only basmati varieties uh, through traditional methods, as well as the molecular marker methods. Uh, again, you are asking, what are the applications? And I had some of the varieties that Dr. Singh and others have developed in this country using the techniques of molecular biology and biotechnology. Uh, in fact, uh, he's also written book and an outstanding teacher. Similarly, Dr. Mahapatra has a legion of students who always remember him. In fact, uh, Dr. Mahapatra has gone beyond uh, you know, the agriculture teaching. He has students uh, doctors from the AIMS who have attended his lecture and flourishing in the molecular biology area. So we have really a very outstanding people with us today uh, to join us in this concluding session. Uh, in fact, IRI and National Institute for Plant Biotechnology are our greatest strength for the genetic trust. Uh, all the workshops, any activity that we conduct is invariably supported by them, and we totally rely on them uh, for their unstinted support. Uh, so we really thank them for joining us in this final concluding session today. Uh, we have nine resource persons who have contributed to this webinar series. They are also there. I welcome all of them. And also, I welcome the participants uh, right now numbering more than 120. And we have had uh, more than 150 every single lecture every day so far. Uh, we are really grateful to all of you. And I extend a very warm welcome. And once again, I remember Professor Chopra, uh, who is the founder of agricultural biotechnology in India. He always said that we have to reach beyond Delhi, because all our activities until now were confined to Delhi. And now, uh, fortunately, uh, and we have been able to reach out uh, beyond Delhi. Uh, in the next few minutes, uh, I would like to just mention uh, about the webinar. We had nine lectures so far and 225 participants. Uh, overwhelming majority of 210 uh, are women or ladies and 15 uh, men uh, participated. That shows the, particularly the nature of uh, school teaching, largely uh, dominated uh, by able teachers. And I think women really do well uh, in this initial education as well as subsequent stages. Uh, we had representation from various parts of the country, Delhi, Orissa, Haryana, Pune, Tamil Nadu, Jaipur, Lucknow, Himachal, West Bengal. So I think we, we are slowly spreading our wings across India, which is a very good sign that uh, we can reach out to more people. Uh, in fact, we had representatives from 20 government schools and from over 100 private schools. Uh, in the past, we had always difficulty reaching to government schools. I'm, I think this is a better way to reach to all the unreached or unreachable so far. Uh, and also, we have a wide profile of these teachers. Uh, as many as 20 have PhDs, and 205 are PG teachers. And also, there are 15 principals and 20 
head of the divisions among the participants, which shows that uh, there is a keen interest as well as a need for helping and communicating with teachers to communicate better to the students. I think we will take this forward. And uh, with this, again, I welcome you all. Uh, and uh, now I request, uh, because Dr. Mahapatra has to go for another meeting, uh, I request uh, Dr. Mahapatra to first say a few words uh, uh, to the participants and also to the trust. Uh, sir, I request you to make your remarks. Okay, good morning, uh, Dr. Bhatt and uh, other colleagues. Uh, my teacher, Dr. Srinivasan, and Dr. Rike Singh, Director IRI, and uh, others, uh, particularly the uh, faculty members uh, who participated uh, in the teaching process. And more importantly, the teachers, teachers who teach and provided opportunity for the trust to listen. So, so that is something which is remarkable that uh, the teachers are willing and coming forward and participating uh, to learn something which uh, probably they are interested in and uh, providing opportunity to the trust uh, to invest their valuable time and uh, resources uh, to support. So this is a beautiful example that the teachers, those who are to teach are learners, are learners from a trust which was established you know, uh, after the successful International Genetics Congress held at New Delhi in 1983. And uh, uh, in that particular event, uh, Professor M. S. Swaminathan and Dr. V. L. Chopra uh, played the leading roles and made this immensely successful. And today, it is painful for me to see that Professor V. L. Chopra is not there with us. It's my tribute to him, the trust, and otherwise the whole country and particularly those, uh, those who have been his student and those who have been associated with him and those particularly studied at IRI and otherwise in the National Agriculture Research System, they know Professor V. L. Chopra and his uh, abiding interest in teaching and in uh, education. Professor Chopra was my teacher, my PhD guide. So he taught me the fundamentals. So today is the day that we are remembering here and then in his memory, we had this, uh, you know, kind of uh, discussion and uh, uh, um, uh, the uh, uh, gen basic genetics, uh, teaching of basic genetics and molecular biology, you know, for biology teachers. Uh, it has been said that uh, how many teachers and all that, and that's something which is highly satisfactory to see that so many teachers are coming. But coming back to the point I was trying to uh, mention that Professor Chopra and his abiding interest, uh, uh, in fact, uh, led us to uh, have this particular program set uh, uh, appropriately uh, by the trust. Uh, in the initial uh, uh, years when this program was being started, interaction with uh, school uh, children, uh, teachers, uh, you know, oh, I was at IRI and I used to be there in these programs, uh, <coughs> conducting practicals and then some of the theory, theory classes. And now that it has, uh, you know, come to this phase, certainly he's uh, foresighting uh, in this particular area and uh, foresighting not just, uh, you know, confining to uh, Delhi, but going beyond. And he thought about it that Genetics, uh, you know, uh, trust can enable uh, the you know whole national biology teachers uh, can be roped in 
and then you know provide the, the right kind of uh, you know uh, information uh, in frontier areas of uh, biology and particularly in genetics and uh, modern genetics uh, so that uh, the students benefit and in fact uh, covid 19 has uh, enabled this particular uh, vision of uh, him that physically bringing teachers to teach them here at Delhi or our panelists, uh, you know, teachers, faculty members together moving to a place, a distant location in the country uh, and impart training. That was, uh, you know, unthinkable. But COVID and its enforcement on our, all of us, a new normal situation, and this is new normal today, that we can connect to anybody and uh, discuss with anybody and have seminar with uh, involving anybody that we wish to, not only in the country, but also abroad. And that possibility emerged and uh, we, we did not uh, you know, explore this earlier, though it was existing, but today you know, it is possible. And I'm extremely happy to see that there are 137 participants already and including four, four, 10 or 12 uh, panelists, faculty members, who delivered their uh, you know, lectures. Uh, so this is uh, you know, a tribute, a real tribute to him, his vision, his foresighting, not only in this area, as a student I know, I used to interact uh, you know, uh, in the evening hours with him after a day's work. And uh, he would be always you know, so inspiring uh, that uh, you, know, you would not feel that you have worked for 10 hours in the day and have slept only for five, six hours in the night. Uh, so he will take away all your uh, kind of uh, uh, difficulties and uh, tiredness that all that you have and provide a new uh, life to you every day evening. And so that you come back next day with a far more vigor uh, than ever before. And that continued for a pretty long time. So, so, and then even after that, you know, he's such a humble personality. He would uh, come into my room and we were in the same wing uh, in the Lal Bahadur Sastri building in the Pusa campus. And he would come in and they'd say, hello. He will never call uh, anybody to his room, for, him and for that matter me. You know, that's the kind of humility he would have always. And the teacher, a great teacher, a great guide, great philosopher, and at the same time, a humble mortal, a humble human being, and uh, always that uh, feeling of togetherness and feeling of uh, family membership that always he would uh, show. And this, uh, he, has he has nurtured this trust so well, and we are today very well placed uh, to take this uh, you know, activity further. So I, uh, you know, uh, have seen the program, and uh, you know the colleagues uh, who have delivered their uh, kind of uh, lectures covering many different areas, and that is something which is uh, praiseworthy that we could cover not only the fundamentals of mapping by Dr. Piroz, uh, but also uh, you know the advanced uh, gen uh, gen genomics application in human. Uh, from Midali, Dr. Midali Mukherjee, uh, who also studied at IRI, you know, for her MSc. And, uh, you know, similarly, uh, topics like RNAi, which is uh, most uh, uh, relevant today, uh, you know, uh, in terms of uh, uh, not only, uh, you know, innovating uh, gene expression, uh, but also, uh, you know, for fundamental studies by way of doing that. Uh, decoding rice genome, Dr. Bhatt uh, mentioned about it, and that's the history and how we struggled without knowing much about genomics uh, in uh, you know 1999 when we started 98, started drafting the project, and uh, and many other chapters which have been covered. Uh, for instance, uh, colleagues from Sarada University they are also present today, and uh, you know covering uh, various fundamentals like gene cloning. Uh, to uh, you know uh, immunity and uh, you know other aspects, so uh, so uh, quite a bit of coverage. And today we talk of COVID, and then you have been talked about the biochemistry of viruses and uh, RNA virus, DNA virus, how they work, 
and the big area in biology very challenging one and animals in uh, you know fish in uh, you know the the plants and uh, human everywhere the virus is a serious challenge and uh, biology teaching uh, must change and biology learning must change how do we really inspire the students and inculcate uh, this process of uh, you know innovation uh, and uh, you know development uh, you know uh, in the frontier areas certainly would uh, uh, help us uh, you know inspire the students uh, to be attracted towards biology because biology is considered to be a soft subject and it doesn't provide on the surface enough opportunity uh, you know challenging opportunity as it appears and those challenges appears to be very tough in case of mathematics and engineering and so on and so forth even medical but in biology general biology related uh, you know once and more so in case of plants it doesn't appear so challenging so i believe that such kind of exposures in the area of genetics genomics modern biology uh, would certainly uh, help the teachers to deliver adequate messages to the students so that they are informed and they are inspired and they are guided by and that's actually very very important and this would be the motto of the whole uh, you know interaction that we are having not just exposing the teachers and that's i used to do that in my classes you know not just telling a subject to the students but generating enough interest in them and how do we really do that you know it's not just telling a particular subject so once the teachers are encouraged and inspired and they have interest and uh, you know they take interest and then you know study uh, adequately uh, and going deeper into the subject they can really do a better job and uh, you know inspire the students in turn that is uh, very very crucial in today's context why i say so i say so because that uh, you know if we say a subject of genetics for instance and it requires quite a bit of mathematics and it requires quite a bit of computational biology in today's genetics whether uh, you know we used to study population genetics and quantitative genetics and today the modern genetics molecular genetics requires quite a bit of mathematics and statistics and understanding there so data analysis in every field it is important but this understanding the basic process and then you know of course uh, interpretation and all that requires a mathematical mindset and uh, can we really uh, have that kind of you know uh, information delivered to the students and uh, more importantly and today we talk of entrepreneurship and if we have innovations adequately packaged and delivered to the students and uh, you know our students are enthused and probably they would be tomorrow's entrepreneurs not every student is going to have higher studies maybe after 10th maybe after plus 2 and there could be some vocational courses in these areas and uh, some testing the genetic testing for instance diagnosis so they can go for such kind of things so i think the whole packaging of genetics and modern genetics should be done in such a way that would not only just enthuse the students but also build their career in the process so tomorrow's research tomorrow's development in the field would depend upon the teachers who are here today and i always say this if the teachers of today if the students of today are no better than the teachers we are going nowhere so the students have to be better than the teachers and often we feel offended if a student is found extra smart and better than the teachers ask me the inconvenient questions and we you know don't really allow that in the schools and we feel offended so i would urge all the teachers who are here today feel humble if the student is doing better if he is extra smart if he has intelligent to outclass us we should be extremely happy we should hand hold we should support we should encourage and then bring that fellow up so that he becomes tomorrow's teacher and not many people are interested in teaching today so those who have interest in teaching those who want to deliver and excel in teaching need to be identified by you and teachers can do that and uh, you know teachers can teach not only teach but also build career and build the character as well and build career and build character and i believe all of you 
would build that character of the students so that they become tomorrow's not only citizen, good citizens, but also good scientists and good administrators and maybe uh, also entrepreneurs. So uh, there is uh, time limiting. So I have a great constraint in elaborating my, what I even wanted to say, but uh, I'm sure you must have uh, learned quite a bit during this period. And uh, I know uh, your interest shows that, that uh, you are involved and engaged and certainly uh, you would like to improve teaching, you would like to improve learning outcomes. And uh, with this exposure, I'm sure uh, that there will be great improvement in learning outcomes. So I highlighted some of those uh, learning outcomes, but I think you will have uh, more of such happening in your front uh, in, in the schools from which you are coming. So I thank uh, Dr. Bhatt for giving me this opportunity, but uh, you know, uh, I don't want to be really emotional, but uh, you know, my mentor, my guide, uh, uh, you know, Professor Chopra is uh, no more. So I am at great loss. So I have no words to express. And, uh, you know, uh, so in his absence, I feel uh, powerless. So, uh, but then I hope, you know, uh, we will continue, uh, you know, uh, God will give us strength to continue these programs of genetic trust. And we have other valued colleagues, Dr. A.K. Singh, Dr. Raisar Bhatt, Dr. Srinivasan, my teacher. So also I think they would continue these activities uh, vigorously. So let the trust survive and let the trust uh, be strengthened and invigorated as we go along. Let the activities be pursued and let the students and teachers benefit from the efforts of the trust. Uh, with these words, I once again thank you all and uh, I will take leave, kindly permit me. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir, for sparing time. Uh, and we always look forward to your support uh, in the trust and elsewhere. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you. Sir, Dr. Akin, sir, I have a request. Uh, if you can, I hope you can spare some more time with us. Yes. Uh, because Please, uh, go ahead with your scheduled program. I will. No, schedule program, no, schedule program is that uh, there are four. Uh, uh, presentations, uh, short presentations about the impressions from the participants. Afterwards, uh, I will ask you to say yeah, a few please, things. please go ahead. Uh, now I request uh, the Dr. Watha maybe to start with. Hello, uh, sir, may I speak? Uh, Dr. Watha is unable to join. You can go ahead, madam. Hello. Sir, Dr. Vata is unable to join because he has called me. He's unable to join. Okay. He's trying please, please. to join. Yeah, yeah. Please go ahead. Uh... Uh, Madam Sashi Balaji. Yes, sir. You can go ahead with your presentation, please. Yeah, okay. please. please. Sir, I am audible. Yes. Yeah. yes. 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 Go ahead. Good morning to all of you, all respected professors, all respected teachers, Honorable Dr. Trilochan Mahapatra, Secretary DARE, and Director General ICAR, Rishi Bhavan, respected Dr. A.K. Singh, Deputy Director General, and all the participants. It's my privilege to be asked to propose a vote of thanks on webinar series on the basic genetics and molecular biology for biology teachers. I'm Shashi Bala Rai, PGT Biology from Presentation Convent Senior Secondary School, Delhi 6. On behalf of Biology Teachers Forum, here together, I extend a very hearty vote of thanks to all speakers for gracing their important work and sharing with us their findings and opinions today. 
I must mention our deep sense of appreciation for Dr. R. Srinivasan for his explanation or RNA interference for crop improvement. It was beautifully started with the video and the NCRT lines were highlighted and explained well, which will be carried out in our class teaching also. My sincere thanks to Dr. Firoz Hussain for explaining linkage, gene mapping, and pedigree analysis with the help of wonderful slides and pictures. Queen Victoria pedigree is, not me is mentioned in the book, but the chart is not given. So now we can use the pedigree chart shown by him and we can utilize to show it with the students also. Further, we are grateful to Dr. Akshay Taluktar and uh, Ms. Monica Jain for demonstrating DNA-based molecular markers and recombinant DNA technology and cloning. And uh, not to forget the types of cloning, which uh, was very clarified, very clearly given to us with the help of pictures. I may like to express a sincere thanks to Dr. Deepak S. Bist for explaining an excellent coverage on PCR hybridization technique and sequence annotation, by which we are very clear what is hybridization and how it is being done and PCR, the methods of PCR. I also wish to express my gratitude to Dr. Shelly Praveen for providing insight on biochemistry of viruses and Dr. Amit Kumar Singh for explaining immunity and immunization, especially about coronavirus, its structure and how it infects in our body and the cells. Because now it's a burning topic, everybody is going through this uh, coronavirus. So it was really interesting. And co in continuity, Dr. Amit Kumar has explained how your body is fighting with this coronavirus or any type of virus. It was really an interesting topic so students will be very eager and interesting to listen all this topic from us. So we will include all those things which we have learned from this webinar. I'm also very grateful to Dr. Mitali Mukherjee for her lecture on application of genomics in human and Dr. Kishore Gaikwad for his analysis of rice genomics and genomic sequencing. And we also would like to acknowledge our gratitude to Lakshmi Srinivasan coordinator of Genetics Trust for coordinating this enriching workshop for us. Finally, I would like to take this opportunity to place on record our hearty thanks to Dr. S. Bhatt. Dr. Bhatt is an executive trustee of Genetics Congress Trust. He has designed the course, content, topics, and resource persons for the workshop. Not to forget his smiling face while introducing every lecture. We are very grateful to you, sir, for this effort and your hard work. I also thanks to Dr. Barman for technically organizing this webinar. As all the topics covered are from CBSE syllabus, so it will be very informative for us and for our students. We can use some of the material and the slides of this workshop directly in the class for better understanding. Topics were very well explained with the help of diagrams, pictures, and cartoons. We assure you that this will help inspire and encourage students to do their best. Some suggestions are there regarding this webinar. Um, th these suggestions are from my side. Online lecture should not be more than 45 minutes, especially when it is twice a day. This is just a suggestion. Uh, more time can be used for discussion and question answer session. If possible, some activities can be included related to the topics. Virtual lab work can also be shown in between if it is possible. Some of the pictures or videos of the labs can be taken and shown directly in the webinar. Uh, this is few suggestions uh, from my side, uh, which can be inculcated for later on. Once again, I want to state that we are all most grateful to all the speakers on this stage. We thank you for being with us with this week, 15 June to 28 June. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, all the participants also, and all those who have joined as a guest also. Thank you, Shri Shri Balaji. Now I request Shri Sushil Kumar Dwedi ji. If he's able to join, sir, uh, Madam, Madam Mamta, ma 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 
there is some hello hello uh, please. yes please madam good morning sir go ahead good morning good, good morning. morning everyone my greeting to all the dignitaries and participant members sir um it's a pleasure to attend the meet this webinar so far as far i am concerned my sister in law dr rashmi saxena gave me this idea she is also attending the webinar to join the with this webinar conducted by genetics congress trust and indian agriculture research institute and i would love to join, uh, visit this institute whenever i got opportunity the, the past 5 days were filled with lots of learning sharing of information and exchanging of ideas thus honing our teaching skills i know just like i am feeling equipped with lots of knowledge and waiting to impart it with my students you all would be feeling the same because sharing knowledge is the best way to of learning which all believe is an ongoing and continuous process during these 5 days i have came to learn so many interesting things about genetics and molecular biology and a new dimensions of knowledge has been added which i feel will be extremely beneficial for the students here i would like to add one more important thing that is there is no age of learning and a true educator should keep on enhancing his or her knowledge as science is a subject which is just like a computer software needs update and it is not an auto update system so we need to attend such knowledgeable lectures and updating our information status last but not the least in the present scenario there are so many misconceptions about corona virus so as an educator it's our prime duty uh, to impart the correction correct information about the disease and the way by which it could be prevented with all the people around yesterday dr shali praveen gave information she shared information about viruses and dr amit kumar singh about immunity immunology very interesting lectures and so whatever discussion we had about the present situation and whether understanding we have acquired should not be left in vain with this rather uh, we should say he uh, use it, uh, it for the benefit of others also with this i wish to extend my deepest gratitude to the educationist and the resource person dr bhat s bhat our coordinator mrs lakshmi nivasan and uh, other resource person behind the, this webinar and really look forward to be the a part of many such programs ahead thank you everyone i will end up with the hope and a prayer that good times will come soon thank you thank you everyone thank you madam uh, do we have sushil kumar varta ji or sushil kumar dwedi ji uh, anyone next sir they have not joined okay uh, if they are not joined i think uh, now i request uh, dr singh to say a few words to the participants uh, dr singh basically we have kept the question answer at the end because that's when we try to continue a whole lot as long as the questions we would like to continue that's how why long, how long that is going to be to First. How long that is going to be the question and answer? Oh, it, 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 maybe it is. It is up to two, two and a half hours. Two two and a half hours? Yeah, it, it is. Uh, you know, it. it <laughs> I I would also like to be enriched. Let us see. I mean, till what time I can spend? So we can start with the question and answer. And uh, as long as I can be with you, I will be with you, and then I will uh, say a few words. Yeah. Right? Okay, okay. that's fine. I I think I I'll, I'll shoot the first question that came today, which is relevant to Dr. Singh. That is, 
how did we win the basmati patent unmute sir how did you how did you win the basmati patent 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 oh, okay it's a today's morning so, question <laughs> yeah as a matter of fact still we are struggling very hard and uh, you know that uh, basmati is now protected under geographical indication gi and gi means that any commodity uh, for which you can produce certain quality if it is grown in a given environment and two it has a historical uh, a, a historical presence in that area so these are the two prime features for giving the protection under geographical indication and uh, right now seven states have been identified for gi and basmati we are having a continuous struggle with the another state uh, madhya pradesh trying hard to get into uh, gi area and the case is in supreme court today morning some newspaper have uh, uh, floated a article on this that the madhya pradesh has gone to supreme court uh, the issue is that madhya pradesh does not have any uh, history of basmati cultivation so for example as a consumer if i ask you would you prefer a basmati dehradun basmati or you will prefer a basmati from madhya pradesh your immediate response will be that uh, i will take uh, dehradun basmati because there is a public perception about dehradun basmati or amritsari basmati in people's mind and uh, that's that's comes with the history and history is not made in 10 years 20 years 30 years so this is a battle is still going on the patent uh, was filed by uh you know in uh, 90s by a, a american company called rice tech and uh, rice tech had developed uh, some lines which were similar to basmati and they called it as texamati but it was uh, a case that was fought uh, long battle with the uh, pida and the government of india invested some 2 crores rupees with the facts and figure associating basmati uh, and its history in india because the earliest record of basmati rice comes from varisha uh, poem and uh, he raja so those evidences were presented in the court of uh, law internationally also and that's how we finally won and uh, now earlier you know the people were using jasmati kalmati texamati and uh, many such confusing words now they are prevented to use that but uh, we have won internationally but our within country fight is still on and we have to win uh, that and th that's our priority next yeah yes sir i am done on this question what what's the difference between genome and gene pool are you can answer that <laughs> so uh, genome uh, you know generally refers to a uh, uh, applied uh, basic set of chromosomes so in every organism you have a basic set of chromosomes for example uh, if you take wheat the basic set of chromosome is uh, uh, it's a hexaploid but if you go come to the individual species there are three genomes a genome b genome and d genome a genome has got seven chromosome b has got seven and d has got seven so the the information that is contained in the basic set of chromosome is uh, that is what is defined as a genome but gene pool is the sum total of genetic information that is available in the collection of the germplasm that you have so uh, that can be you know in form of wild species land races cultivated varieties But the sum total of genes that are present, the entire variability that is there, is is referred to as gene. And gene pool is defined as primary, secondary, and tertiary. The primary gene pool is, uh, you know, where the two members can be easily crossed with each other, and there is free exchange of genetic material. Uh, secondary gene pool, you have uh, some difficulties in making crosses, but uh, you can use certain tools like embryo rescue and other things to. get viable uh, hybrids and uh, develop cross if you go to tertiary gene pool it becomes uh, quite uh, difficult to do the gene transfer and many times you go beyond that you bring the genes uh, from you know uh, microorganisms into plants for specific
maybe the third question also uh, this uh, you might find it uh, strange after so many lectures also this keeps on coming and again and again we, in fact in this lecture also we had an explained it uh, i think you would be the best person to again clarify <laughs> the, the last person who has not still got it the difference between gene allele and whether multiple alleles could be linked it was stated earlier but still someone has again a lingering doubt how to distinguish gene and allele and multiple alleles are the multiple alleles could be linked okay <laughs> good question so uh, the you know very simple definition that uh, uh, that is just for this is the alternative form of a gene so gene if you define as a uh, a place okay a locus locus is a place in the genome which uh, consists of say certain nucleotides generally a gene size is say about uh, 2 to 5 kb and this particular location that makes uh, one gene if you get the alternative form of the same gene it is called allele now you can have two alternative forms you can have multiple alternative forms of a gene so if you have multiple alternative forms that will be called as multiple alleles for example in case of blood group you have got a b o three alternative forms and uh, this the position is exactly identical so uh, for a gene if you have three alleles all those three alleles will have exactly same locus are same position in the genome the position will not change this why it is called alternative form of a gene for example all the mendelian traits that you have studied for example red flower color white flower color these are the two alternative form of one uh, gene so likewise all the traits seven traits you have uh, a alternative uh, form i hope i am clear uh, the the doubt is because of what Uh, if I uh, I uh, if I uh, go uh, to a is uh, share a screen and then I can share yeah right just a minute uh, then uh, I can use a board to draw and then uh, probably that uh, maybe I I I can supplement yeah uh, the. many times people have difficulty understanding gene and allele uh, in my opinion i I'll, i'll give you like this say we have a gene for leaf shape okay yeah hypothetical gene for leaf shape leaf shape could be oval incision or you know a, a single leaf or a compound leaf these are called character states of the leaf they are all leaf shapes only so to say that this is leaf shape leaf shape is a g and the various uh, forms of that leaf shape or we can call as alleles uh, this is how one can differentiate between otherwise if you say i say that gene for plant height there will be multiple genes for plant height uh, that's why rh1 rh2 so they all contribute to plant height but how do you distinguish one from the other because they are located at different places on the chromosomes maybe on the same chromosome or different chromosomes uh, i think that will slightly expand your idea of what we mean by gene allele and uh, different genes contributing to the same trait uh, dr singh Yeah, Doctor Bhatt. Just perfectly fine. Uh, what what he said. Yeah, Doctor Vasan, you wanted to add something. Yeah, I, both the uh, teachers on the panel, Doctor Sushil Kumar Vatta and Doctor Sushil Kumar Devedi, have joined. So okay. uh, you uh, invite uh, them okay. to come. Okay. Okay. I just wanted to mention that. Okay. Uh, so with this uh, depiction, I would like to explain. For example, this is a chromosome. Some chromosome. For example, chromosome number one in P. and uh, this is the homologous chromosome because each chromosome is present in two doses in diploid organelle now this particular locus or region in the genome is uh, a I gene for example capital a can you see the screen uh, can't you see 
I am not able to see. I do not know anybody else. Others are able to see this thing. Yes, yes, we are. We are able to see, sir. Yeah, right. So, as you know, that a gene consists of certain uh, sequences of nucleotide, and the length of a gene could be about two thousand to five thousand base pairs. And uh, if that is the length here, for example, and the sequence of nucleotides. uh decides you know the uh, what kind of protein that gene will make now if there is an alteration in that particular sequence in place of a uh, particular sequence for example a if you get a c and that altered position of the nucleotide if it results into a change in the protein that is encoded and in turn it changes the phenotype you get an alternative phenotype the term allele and genes they were all coined on the basis of phenotypic differences so if you get an alternative phenotype and that at molecular level can happen because of the change in nucleotide sequence uh, which alters the protein so now if you have the the position of the gene remains the same okay exactly identical position but there is a change in the sequence that leads to change in the phenotype alternative phenotype and that alternative phenotype for a particular trait becomes a alternative allele so this small a becomes a alternative allele of capital a a allele of capital a cannot be located on chromosome 2 it can be a copy of this can be located but that you will not call as allele so to call it allele it has to be exactly at the same location and that's why we call alternative form of a gene at the same locus at the same locus and this is underlying word alternative form of a gene at the same locus is allele if it happens elsewhere because sometimes there are multiple copy genes and capital a may be present elsewhere in the genome on chromosome 2 and their mutation happens and then you get alternative phenotype that will not be called as allele it will be called as allele only when it is at the same locus so this is the point that must be understood in context of what a allele is i will stop sharing this okay yeah Uh, we we will request now dr watta sushil kumar watta ji good morning sir to share his impression yeah please share your impressions thank you very much sir am i audible sir yes yes okay uh, first of all good morning to all the dignitaries uh, this web series uh, on basic genetics and uh, molecular biology has started from 15th of june and today it is the concluding day so i found it very informative and interactive sessions which have enhanced our knowledge and understanding about the subject and we have been variously benefited but definitely i would like to mention two number one we have learned how to convert the reality into opportunity in ongoing covid-19 restrictions and secondly we have also learned and improved our knowledge and understanding about basic concepts on the topics which are related with genetics and biotechnology and these were well addressed by all the mentors definitely this information and the content which we have received uh, this will be shared with our students who will be also immensely benefited like us so whatever we have learned we have to practice and uh, there should be quest for knowledge always uh, my humble suggestions however may be that the topics of plant breeding may kindly be included in future because there are many uh, there is one chapter complete chapter uh, which is devoted for the work which has been done in iri pusa so perhaps i think this has to be included in future and any other topic besides genetics and biotechnology from class 11th and 12th book as per the need and requirement of our teachers may also be taken up and since education is a lifelong process so i do hope to get such interactions in future too so personally i uh, i am thankful to you for offering me this opportunity thank you very much sir thank you vata sir uh, is uh, 
यूएडी जी अवेलेबल है या नहीं है आई थिंक अवेलेबल सर सभी को प्रणाम मैं सुशील कुमार द्विवेदी केंद्रीय विद्यालय अलीगंज लखनऊ से आपके साथ जुड़ा हुआ हूं और बड़ी मैं अपनी भावनाओं को एक एक करके व्यक्त करना चाहता हूं जो मैंने 15 से लेके 20 जून तक आपके द्वारा जो विभिन्न प्रकार के साइंटिफिक सेशन आयोजित किए गए जेनेटिक्स ट्रस्ट और आईएआरआई इंडियन एग्रीकल्चर रिसर्च इंस्टीट्यूट इसके लिए बहुत ही ज्यादा बधाई का पात्र है और मैं ईश्वर का बहुत बड़ा एक कहता हूँ कि धन्यवाद देना चाहता हूँ कि मुझे इतने अच्छे फोरम से जुड़ने का मौका मिला मैं चूंकि वास्तु बारहवीं कक्षा के विद्यार्थियों को पढ़ाता हूँ यहाँ मेरे यहाँ बायोटेक्नोलॉजी भी है और बायोलॉजी अलग से सब्जेक्ट के रूप में हम लोग पढ़ाते हैं तो ऐसी स्थिति में जो हम लोगों ने यहाँ पर जो परेशानियां फील कर रहे थे उनमें एक एक करके आपके द्वारा जो हमें और मदद मिली जो हम आगे चल के अपने बच्चों को जो आपके द्वारा दिया गया नॉलेज है उसको हम आगे ट्रांसफर करेंगे जिसमें सबसे बड़ी एक दिक्कत लिंकेज समझाने में बच्चों के साथ आती थी रिकॉम्बिनेशन समझाने में आती थी फिर डिग्री एनालिसिस का ना केवल प्रैक्टिकल था बल्कि थ्योरी भी थी तो बहुत ही ज्यादा इसमें शिक्षक हम शिक्षक परेशानी महसूस करते थे और जितने सरल ढंग से आपने वहां पर अपने जो डिस्टिंग जो हमारे रिसोर्स पर्सन थे उनके द्वारा समझाने के लिए हमें और आपको जो हम लोगों को समझने का मौका मिला उनसे समझने का मौका मिला इसके लिए मैं बहुत बहुत धन्यवाद देता हूँ देखिए क्लोनिंग वेक्टर और जीन एडिटिंग ये नई टेक्निक टेक्निक है जीन एडिटिंग विशेषकर क्रिस्पर कैस नाइन और डिजाइनर बेबी को लेके अक्सर बच्चों में ये उभरते रहते थे सवाल और हम शिक्षक भी जानना चाहते थे तो वो भी हमें कुछ हद तक सीखने का मौका मिला प्लॉटिंग टेक्निक और पीसीआर विशेषकर इस समय जैसे न्यू कोविड 19 के लड़ने में आईटी पीसीआर रैपिड डायग्नोस्टिक किट या एंटीजन सेंसिटिविटी टेस्ट किट की बारे में चर्चा हो रही तो ये जो नई टेक्निक जो न केवल ट्वेल्थ में है बल्कि और आगे के नॉलेज के लिए आप लोगों ने जो ये हमारे आदरणीय रिसोर्स पर्सन ने जो इस हमको ज्ञान दिया उसके लिए मैं बहुत बहुत धन्यवाद देना चाहता हूँ और साथ ही सेंगर सिक्वेंसिंग सिक्वेंस एनोटेशन ये जो आगे का ज्ञान है नेक्स्ट जनरेशन सिक्वेंसिंग ये भी हमारे न केवल हमें भविष्य में और अच्छे से हमको सशक्त करेगा अपने सब्जेक्ट को पढ़ाने के लिए अब जीनोम और जीनोमिक्स की बात करें तो हर भले ही ह्यूमन जीनोम प्रोजेक्ट आने के बाद जो हमारे आपके एक्सपेक्टेशन थे वो पूरे नहीं हुए लेकिन फिर भी जानने का मौका मिला और ये चूंकि एक अंतहीन सिलसिला है अभी बहुत सारे ऑर्गेनिज्म का जीनोम कोड करना बाकी है और आपने जो हमें हम शिक्षकों को ये ज्ञान दिया तो उसके लिए मैं बहुत बहुत धन्यवाद देता देना चाहता हूँ श्रीनिवासन सर का विशेष का धन्यवाद क्योंकि उन्होंने आर एन साइलेंसिंग या जीन साइलेंसिंग का बहुत अच्छे से जिक्र किया और जो 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 जीन साइलेंसिंग या आर एन इंटरफेरेंस जो ये कक्षा बारहवीं में बायोटेक्नोलॉजी में बहुत ज्यादा परेशानी का एक सबक होता है हम शिक्षकों के लिए बच्चे अक्सर परेशान रहते हैं तो ये भी बहुत अच्छा रहा न केवल हम लोगों ने डी ऑफ दी राइस जीनोम बल्कि और भी उसके पीछे की विज्ञान को समझा और डॉक्टर सैली परवीन मैम ने जो बायोकेमिस्ट्री ऑफ वायरसेस वायरसेस के बारे में इतने अच्छे से सारे वायरसेस के बारे में बताया ना केवल प्लांट वायरसेस बल्कि एनिमल वायरसेस और सारा क्लासिफिकेशन के साथ साथ कोविड वायरस के साथ जुड़ा तो ये एक बहुत ही अच्छा एक मौका था कि एक साथ इतने सारे एक्सपर्ट एक प्लेटफॉर्म पर कितना सारा उनका एक्सपीरियंस पूरा उन्होंने हम शिक्षकों के लिए दिया और लास्ट में देखिए डॉक्टर ए के सिंह साहब ने इम्यूनिटी एंड इम्यूनाइजेशन जो इस समय पूरी दुनिया वैक्सीन के लिए बड़ी ही आशावादी निगाहों से वैज्ञानिकों के ऊपर देख रही है और वैक्सीन वैक्सीन की साइंस क्या है ना केवल बहुत पीछे से उन्होंने शुरुआत करके और जो लेटेस्ट वैक्सीन जो जीन बेस्ड वैक्सीन है वहां तक हम लोगों को बताया और उन तमाम संभावनाओं के बारे में बताया जिनके द्वारा आगे चल के हम शायद कोरोना वायरस पर भी विजय प्राप्त कर सकते हैं मैं अपने दिल की गहराइयों से जेनेटिक ट्रस्ट इंडियन एग्रीकल्चर रिसर्च इंस्टीट्यूट और जो श्रीनिवासन मैडम ने मुझे चुकी है मौका दिया बोलने के लिए कि आप सर लखनऊ से जुड़े हुए हैं मैं बहुत धन्यवाद देता देना चाहता हूं और ये मेरे लिए लाइफ चेंजिंग एक इवेंट था मैं तमाम मेरे भी काफी बिजी शेड्यूल थे क्योंकि हम लोग ऑनलाइन क्लास भी ले रहे हैं और स्कूल संबंधी भी जिम्मे जिम्मेवार हमको सौंपी गई हैं लेकिन फिर भी मैंने समय निकाल के जैसे और आपके वीडियो लेक्चर भी सुने अलग से और उनको संग्रहित किया और मैं पूरी विश्वास के साथ कहता हूँ 
कि हम अपने बच्चों में जो हमारे अलग अलग प्रांतों के कहीं भी हम लोग केंद्रीय विद्यालय के शिक्षक जाते हैं तो आपके द्वारा जो हमें ज्ञान दिया गया ये निश्चित ही पूरे भारतवर्ष में और दुनिया में हमारे बच्चे फैलाएंगे पुनः में आपका सबका अपने दिल की गहराइयों से शुक्रिया कहता हूँ धन्यवाद और सभी को मेरी तरफ से सादर प्रणाम धन्यवाद द्विवेदी जी हेलो जी सर जी सर हम अभी जो है ये ये, ये नाइन लेक्चर हमने एट ए शॉर्ट नोटिस जो है जो आपकी तरफ से जो कीवर्ड्स आए थे हमें ये चाहिए ये चाहिए उस बेसिस पे किया है नाउ लुकिंग एट द रिस्पांस बट साहब यू आर नॉट ऑडिबल ओ सॉरी टुडे आई हैव सम प्रॉब्लम लुक्स लाइक एट माय एंड एम आई ऑडिबल नो गो अहेड या या गो अहेड नो नो वी आर प्लानिंग टू चॉक आउट अनदर सीरीज ऑफ लेक्चर्स कवरिंग ऑल एरियाज ऑफ बायोलॉजी in your school textbooks uh, so looking at the response we will take up this uh, because this we have you know put together within a, a matter of one week trying to find the resource persons and others looking at this success we will expand on this we will assure you that we will try to cover as much as possible the biology particularly biology part of your ncert books uh, this is the assurance from my side थैंक यू वेरी मच सर वी आर होपिंग वी विल इन फ्यूचर यू विल प्रोवाइड अस अपॉर्चुनिटी टू ज्वाइन दोज लेक्चर्स डॉक्टर सिंह वी वी हैव एक्चुअली देर आर सम क्लैरिफिकेशन पीपल वॉन्टेड एन एक्सटेंडेड यू नो प्रेजेंटेशन on southern and probe and pcr and some of the things we, on which earlier lecture was given because uh, for that we have separate presentation uh, which would last quite, quite a bit of time later on dr deepak bist and dr srinivasan will be taking uh, this one uh, i therefore i request you to uh, please uh, make your remarks at this stage uh, so that we can take up that later Okay. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Bhatt, for giving me this opportunity. It's my uh, pleasure to be here with this group. Uh, our Director General ICR and Secretary Dr. Mahapatra spoke very well about the entire uh, program and the uh, contribution that Professor Chopra has made to the science of genetics in uh, nationally as well as uh, internationally. and this uh, program is a befitting tribute to professor chopra's uh, contribution uh, you know in 1983 when the genetics uh, congress international genetics congress was organized the theme uh, that was identified by professor chopra dr swamnathan and others was microbes to man and it was so appropriate you, you can imagine 1983 the congress was held uh, almost uh, 35 years uh, back more than that and uh, microbes to man uh, which became a reality that people took out genes from uh, bacillus thuringiensis bacteria transferred it to a cotton plant to impart resistance to wallworm and that cotton plant produced cotton which could be used for clothing so how you reach the using science from microbe to man from a bacteria to man for human kind welfare is a great example and that was the title of international genetics congress at that point of time how well thought of he has been uh, in fact a great uh, teacher researcher and lived uh, professor jobra lived every moment of his life uh, in discussing science till last uh, uh, breath he was always uh, for it and we had he was on the research advisory committee of the indian agricultural research institute and last two meetings had very close interactions we had big ideas what kind of changes can be uh, brought in and this is a really befitting tribute to his memory uh, this uh, particular uh, program as i have seen the uh, profile of the uh, attendees the profile of teachers who are participating and also the uh, lecturers who presented their views point in this is uh, so overwhelming to see this 
you know, we did not have this kind of opportunity when we were a student. And uh, I remember when we were doing BSc Agriculture in Banaras in the university, uh, they, we had a basic genetics course, we had plant breeding, cytogenetics, but uh, in, in genetics, we did not have any opportunity for doing any practical. We will be uh, taught about uh, Mendel's laws of genetics. Sometimes people will say four laws of uh, Mendel's, law of uh, unit character, law of dominance, law of segregation, law of independent assortment. Some books will mention law of dominance, law of segregation, law of independent assortment. And some will say, no, there are only two laws, and those are law of uh, segregation and law of independent assortment. Never we had any opportunity to uh, practically see how uh, genetic segregation would happen when you make a monohybrid cross, when you make a dihybrid cross, the opportunities were not available. We studied in BSC agriculture about, uh, you know, celebrity young chromosomes. We studied about lambrus chromosomes, but all it was in theory. We never had an opportunity to see this practically. First time when we came to IRI for doing our master's in genetics, uh, that we could see the celebrity gland chromosome of uh, Drosophila. And that was a kind of lifetime experience to see first time the celebrity gland chromosome. Now, our colleague uh, who participated in this teaching program, uh, Dr. Firoz Hussain, he has come out with the wonderful teaching tool for his schools and uh, entitled uh, Genetics on Maize Cob. So on a single cob of maize, you can see the monohybrid segregation, you can see dihybrid segregation, you can see all kinds of modifications of Mendelian ratios. And uh, I would urge, I'm sure Firoz has discussed about it, our director general wanted that we should prepare a manuscript on this and this should go to, uh, you know, journals like uh, Nature or Science because the very concept that is built in there so far, this has not become a teaching tool. It has been used in higher studies, but not for the school teaching. We published in Indian Journal of Genetics and Plant Breeding. Dr. Bert played a very important role in this. And uh, this has become very handy and very well appreciated. Now our efforts is that to generate resources through some external funding, create the genetic stock and make it available to the schools so that uh, people can really see the students, if you just give them a cob where the seed shape is segregating, you have some uh, sugary type and non-sugary type, some are sunken, some are uh, plumpy, and they can just sell the cob, they can count the number of seeds, how many uh, wrinkled, how many, you know, um, uh, round type or normal shapes are there and uh, they can fit it to a particular segregation uh, ratio of phase to one, they can use chi square test, all those kinds of possibilities exist and seeing is believing. The once you show the students this kind of material, they will uh, be convinced with what you are saying. Otherwise, all the times even we imagine, you know, when till we have not seen DNA, we uh, imagine and, and also the discovery part if you see, when you look at the chromosome theory of inheritance, which was proposed by Sutton and Bowery, uh, they said that uh, the genes are located in chromosome because genes uh, are Mendelian factors described by Mendel earlier. And the chromosome behavior during mitosis and meiosis was described by uh, Wiseman and, uh, you know, uh, the Valdier discovered chromosome in 1872 and 1882 and 84 mitosis meiosis were discovered. So when chromosomes were a physical entity which could be seen in microscope and you could see how chromosomes are segregated. When you start with the diploid cell, the number is double and it gets reduced to half. So here was a situation where you could physically see and that was seeing is believing. And that was correlated with Mendel saying that the factors, there are factors which are determinant of the trace and these factors exist in paired form. You have to only imagine, just think like two uh, balls or something paired form and in gamete, their number is uh, reduced to half, it becomes one. And then when the fertilization takes place, it uh, gets doubled. Now you had the Mendelian concept, Mendel's law of genetics that was investigated by, it was rediscovered by 1909. And then chromosome theory came, which said that there is a parallelism between behavior of Mendelian factors and the behavior of chromosomes. Because the Mendelian factors are also present in paired form, the chromosomes are also present in paired form. In gametes, the number is reduced half for the Mendelian factor, also for the chromosomes. 
and on fertilization it is restored. So because of this parallelism in the behavior of genes and chromosome, that they said that genes are located in chromosome. And then came, you know, several physical basis of chromosome theory of inheritance and so on. The point I'm trying to make is that uh, you can convince the students uh, very easily if we have something to show them. And that is where developing these kinds of tools for the school is extremely important, which I am sure we will be able to arrange and, uh, you know, uh, distribute and also provide the genetic stock so that people can maintain themselves with the training because teachers are there for a longer period. They would be staying for 30 years, 40 years in a school. So they can maintain this kind of material uh, in perpetuity and that will be uh, good for the students. Uh, I, I think uh, this kind of training program should be organized more frequently. When we had uh, this uh, by physical presence, I remember the number used to go around 40, 50, more than that, and it was only restricted to uh, Delhi schools. In all other uh, our training programs from the trust, we could not go beyond uh, Delhi. But this uh, has provided us the opportunity to go beyond the uh, uh, you know, NCR region, and we have the participants from throughout the country. Excellent questions coming. In fact, there are still many questions that need to be addressed. Somebody is asking, what is the uh, difference between microsatellites, mini satellites, and VNTR, variable number up and number repeats? Actually, VNTRs and VNTRs you can group into two categories. The one are microsatellites, other are mini satellites. The microsatellites differ from mini satellites in the sense that, in case of microsatellites, the number of repeat units, uh, the number of nucleotides, uh, a number of units uh, of repeats uh, per unit is one to nine. And the number of uh, you know repeat units uh, is up to 100. While in case of mini satellites, uh, the number of uh, bases uh, that you have per uh, unit, the number of repeats is more, and the number of repeat units uh, at a given locus are also quite uh, high. So that's what basically differentiates the micro satellites for mini satellites. But uh, these both are the forms of variable number of random uh, repeats. Some, uh, for example, micro satellites where the number of repeat units are one to uh, nine. Uh, these are, uh, and how many times they are repeated? These have been extensively utilized in the uh, crop genetics for molecular mapping. And the micro satellite maps in many crops have been prepared. Many satellites uh, have been used. For example, uh, the, uh, you must have been told about the uh, probes uh, from Snake, which Professor uh, Lal Ji Singh developed for fingerprinting in human uh, systems are those uh, some of the examples of many uh, satellites. So uh, likewise, there are many more, uh, I think, interesting questions that also need to be, uh, you know, uh, addressed uh, during the deliberation. I uh, once again would like to thank all the uh, organizers, Professor Bhatt, Professor Srinivasan, Madam Srinivasan, and the lecturers who have given their presentations, extremely good presentations, Dr. Talukdar, Firoz, uh, Dr. Sally, and many, many more. And uh, I'm thankful to uh, each one of you for giving me uh, this opportunity. We will make it a regular uh, feature now, uh, and uh, the IRI will be uh, always uh, more than happy to partner with the Genetics Trust to do such activities uh, in future as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, uh, for your very encouraging words. And uh, you have always been extremely supportive to the Genetic Trust. In fact, uh, I take it for granted <laughs> uh, that I will have support from genetics and IARI. Uh, and uh, many times I to take your permission later saying that, okay, we have fixed up this, could you please join? Could you please help? And you have been very kind to extend this help and to look forward to more collaborative uh, work with IRI and Genetic Trust in the future. Uh, particularly the school students visit. Uh, this is one thing which I have been handling uh, because school students, uh, find it extremely beneficial to visit IRI fields and the labs. Uh, normally what happens is that uh, if they write to 
the IRI or any divisions, it is assigned to some persons and those persons will be doing their best, no doubt, but they would not be having the previous connect with the schools. Whereas we have dealt with those schools, we have the connect with the teachers that makes it possible for us to you know, show them the appropriate labs and also where exactly what is available. Because somebody writes to nematology or to vegetables, let us say. It might not be the right season, but they will still show. Whereas if they write to me, I will say what is right to visit at that particular time or on a particular day and take them appropriately there. This is how this uh, genetic trust has been able to fine tune their visits. Uh, I think uh, this sort of working model would be much better to uh, introduce or to arrange visits of students. I think we will have it much more uh, you know, on basis. Uh, I would like to identify resource persons within different divisions and link them to genetic trust. So that whenever there is a request, we will directly contact that person from that division without undergoing through the bureaucratic setup. I hope that that will, arrangement will work. And uh, it, it will be duly acknowledged, whatever visit, whatever this one that we take from the IRI or an IPP or from that matter, you know, an NBPGR. And uh, I think this will be able to make it much more effective than, uh, you know, random visits. Uh, wherein you know, children are herded and taken towards museum here and there. they never go with complete satisfaction. In fact, sometimes they did uh, express this because when I was uh, on some other assignment outside, they visited and they were not uh, very happy to, you know, th their expectations were not met. Uh, I think uh, this is the arrangement that we can have in the future. Uh, we will, we will certainly, uh, I think, do it. We will be more than happy to do it because uh, any organized uh, visit is always uh, better and we can uh, craft it in such a manner that uh, it, it serves the purpose of the client, particularly the schools. And uh, at least, you know, such visits twice, uh, I, when we have to expose the students to uh, crop genetics and crop in uh, particulars, then... Uh, one, sometimes in the month of, uh, say, September end uh, for all the Kharif crops, and then the other visit in the month of uh, March. These two visits can be March, of course, it coincides with the examination period, but even if it can be a little early, it uh, doesn't matter. But that will uh, help a lot uh, to have it, and we will be happy to have the help from the genetics uh, trust to do it as a regular uh, feature. It is good for both, for IRI as well as for genetics. For those who have not uh, seen earlier, the picture that you see in my background, the virtual background, is uh, the old building of IRI. It was established in 1905 at uh, Pusa Bihar in Samastipur that was earlier in Darbhanga district. And this building uh, was called at that point of time as Naulakha building. It was built at a cost of 9 lakh rupees in 1905. Uh, but there was an earthquake in 1934, and because of that, it was uh, devastated. It was shifted then to Delhi. Uh, the contribution for building this, you know, uh, institute there came from a philanthropist from uh, U.S. Uh, his name was Henry Phipps. So Phipps was from U.S.A. Uh, sometimes people say that P was taken from his name and U.S.A. He belonged to. That's how the name Pusa, P.U.S.A. Uh, was given to the place there. And when it was shifted to Delhi, the name Pusa came from there, Pusa Road, Pusa Institute, and so on and so forth. But as a matter of fact, if when we examined this and found that uh, the name Pusa as a village existed in the local land records uh, at that point of time. That's how the name Pusa came. Uh, but I, I just thought of mentioning that this is just not any other building. This is very historical, very important building. Uh, which is the birthplace of uh, today's Indian Agriculture Research Institute. Then it was Imperial Agriculture Research Institute. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Singh. Uh, sir, particularly uh, organizing visits of the students from the schools is always problematic. In the sense, every school has its own dates when they can arrange. 
because of their school logistics, the buses and all those things. That is why it always comes at a very short notice and we cannot fix a, any particular date for the, uh, this is how we have been trying to accommodate them. Uh, in this sense, we have to take their date as the date. Uh, that is the main reason. It's perfectly uh, fine. We will do it that way. I'm also yeah. trying to, uh, you know, learning from some international, uh, you know, exposure. Like when we go to IRI, International Rice Research Institute for Visit. So they have uh, beautifully designed, uh, you know, uh, vehicles. And these are kind of, uh, you know, a uh, open trolley with sitting uh, benches uh, with all four sides open so that uh, the students or visitors can sit in that and they are... Uh, uh, driven to the entire farm area. So because our farm is big, research is very spread, we can design one nice one, we can convert one tractor uh, trolley into that or something like that so that the visit is facilitated and uh, it would be good to cover. Otherwise, uh, they get exhausted in the scorchy sun and after seeing one or two places, they feel completely exhausted. They say, you want to go. We will try to facilitate and uh, make it uh, better. For Yes, yeah, certainly. You, you, we have this uh, open rooftop uh, London Rama and that sort of buses. If we can have one, uh, maybe we can uh, think of uh, having that. That will be a wonderful way of taking them around. Uh, certainly, we will work on that. Thank you, sir. Uh, there are question answer sessions, which we will continue with this. Uh, because uh, for some of the question answers, which are short, can be handled. But uh, we have structured a presentation uh, from Dr. Bist as well as Dr. Srinivasan to clarify certain points uh, which the teachers wanted. Uh, with that in mind, the smaller questions and additional questions we'll take uh, after the, these two presentations. And uh, since uh, we do not know about the pressures on Dr. Singh's time, I would like to thank Dr. Singh as well as Dr. Mahapatra uh, for sparing their invaluable time uh, with us and also for all the support extended to hold this webinar. In fact, we have been dependent on extension division, uh, Dr. Berman, uh, for providing the, all the support from back all the time. In fact, he was busy with something, other own programs, he had to go somewhere, but he was always on uh, his mobile monitoring everything and trying to record this. So we have a permanent archive now, uh, which is available through the IRI right now. It's also on the YouTube live. Uh, and also we will make it available from Genetic Trust website. Right now we do not have, we are in the process of launching it. It will be also available uh, and all other future events also will be available uh, for all time use. Uh, with this, I thank Dr. Singh and Dr. Mahapatra. Uh, you can stay on uh, or you can... Thank you. Thank you, Raksha. Thank you. Thank you. thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, now I request uh, Dr. Deepak or uh, Dr. Srinivasan, one of them, to... Srinivasan, sir, can uh, start. Sir. Okay. Uh, if I have to start, uh, I, I just need two minutes. I'll disconnect from here and go to my laptop for presentation. Just give me a minute. Just give me a minute. Uh, in the meantime, I would like to just make an announcement which has been a lot of questions about lack of around. Uh, hello, am I audible? Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, there has been lots of questions about lack of around. Uh, which we think deserves a separate lecture, uh, which we will be arranging shortly. Uh, I think uh, there is no easy justification that we can answer a bit of it, this here and there, considering the uh, complexity of lack of Iran, uh, uh, I think we will, we will hold a separate lecture. There is also a requirement uh, whether we can have webinar for students. Uh, Certainly, students can be uh, included in the webinar, but at this moment, I think uh, the requirements of students are best understood by the teachers, and they know what they have covered, what they have not covered. I would 
still prefer to restrict our webinars to the teachers although anybody can join but uh, targeting specifically to students would require much more intimate uh, connection with the students on a regular long term basis so i would rather uh, use caution uh, before you know facing the students because it is not just saying something uh, we should be effective in communication that's why we do not want to replace the teachers we would like to support the teachers that is our motto uh, i think that uh, is what i wanted to convey uh, uh, the other questions that uh, we can handle before the continuous and comes on is uh, it is written in the textbook says that uh, introns have a higher frequency of mutations than the coding region yes because any mutation within the intron except at the junction uh, will not lead to any consequences that is why any mutation in the intronic region will be tolerated uh, whereas in any mutation in the coding region could alter either the protein being coded or it could shift the frame leading to loss of function mutation uh, that is why there is a higher frequency of mutation uh, one could see in the intronic region not in the coding region uh, let us wait for dr srinivasan to come uh, similarly the request was there about plant breeding to be included i have told that we will include almost all parts of biology in coming months and virtual labs yes uh, we have been working with uh, uh, one dr pillai from iiib uh, to support virtual lab creation of virtual lab Uh, she is an expert she she has expressed her, her interest to help us in that and and we will be experimenting on that also uh, that is about the virtual lab uh, i think we will wait for dr srinivasan to join and also there is a, there are many questions on transposons uh, transposon is also something that we feel requires a separate lecture uh, so lack of operon on transposons will be a separate lecture in the sir uh, near can i future. start yes please
am i audible yeah i can hear you uh is the screen visible now no i i do not see i do not know others we can see the screen also sir and we are audible you can see the screen yes sir okay uh, deepak deepak keep monitoring because i have some problem today with Fine. my internet Fine. okay uh, uh there were few questions i have select uh, which dr bhat has uh, assigned me uh, uh, regarding the webinar series which we had and particularly with respect to rnai and the, there are four questions question number 1 what is meant by sense strand and anti sense strand number 2 how do you clone a dna fragment to obtain anti sense rna uh, and so the third is somebody raised a question i did talk of uh, short hairpin loop rna and ds rna so one of the participant had raised a question of what is the purpose of creating a such rna when ds rna can do the function i'll talk about that fourth is what i'm going to answer is one of uh, the teachers asked a very important question of if uh, double stranded rna is so unstable how are the rna is put a very very intelligent question so uh, let me take them one by one uh, i had talked about them but still i would like to repeat this okay uh, this is uh, now uh, dna you all know is double stranded okay so we have assigned this nomenclature of sense and anti sense now let me explain how this nomenclature has been devised if you look at the two these two strands the let us say the top strand which says atg gcc tgg act tca this is the strand the other bottom strand is 3 prime to 5 prime you already know that the transcription will take place from in the direction of 5 prime to 3 prime so the top strand so complementary strand to the bottom strand will be that sequence will be mrna sequence which is shown here so you would notice that it is aug instead of t it is u so you have gg cc you, you can see that the top strand now makes sense in the form of mrna for the translation process to begin what do you mean by sense because this language of nucleic acid is being now translated it was transcribed into rna now it is being translated so the to the translator the language has to make a sense so that it can make a protein so this strand sequence of which matches with the rna exact match is called sense strand and since it is called sense strand the other people call the other strand as anti sense strand i i hope uh, this is clear okay now the other question was how do you clone a dna fragment to obtain anti sense rna uh, i i think you uh, all some of you might have uh, listened to monica jain ji's talk about how do you clone she said you cut it with a restriction enzyme and notice that the fragment which is uh, sorry the fragment which can be cloned can go in both the orientation okay so you will have two clones from the same one would be from the uh, let us say the top strand stained as a top strand in the uh, plasmid the other would be in the opposite so in that case the bottom strand will become top strand it will only make sense if rna is produced now uh, the second slide here the vector if you look at the sequence which is given in red and the sequence which is given in green now if i want to make rna from that is complementary to each of these then it has to be it can be cloned into the vector and if there is a promoter which is shown by a blue arrow on top it will transcribe the rna sequence based on its position so in one case strand number 1 will be synthesized which is sense strand in the other case if you have cloned it in the other orientation the second strand will be synthesized and if now you let us say i was talking about rnai if you introduce these two constructs with the proper promoter which is a plant promoter into a plant cell 
both these strands will be synthesized resulting in a dsrm now in this case you would realize that if i want to do this i have to do two transformations that is i have to use vector 1 to transform uh, introduce this construct into plant then i have if i have to introduce vector 2 i have to transform it again with the same process of whether it is agrobacterium or gene cloning with the proper promoter the second vector to generate double strand in the plant in order to over so the next i come to the next one so this is illustrated here so if you have a gene if you have a complementary copy that is being uh, transcribed in the other so you get sense and anti sense and you get the duplex formation which is dsrm the other question was asked why do you need short hair spin uh, rna now the idea is that instead of doing one transformation if i can introduce both these strands together in a construct so here the uh, construct is shown in simplified terms i thank deepak for making this slide for me uh, so you see on top you have a strand on bottom you have a strand now notice that the ones which are shown in red a a c c g t t you will find that you have a complementary copy that is because it is anti sense and in between in the black there is a spacer sequence so what would happen is it, if you transform just with this construct with a promoter on one side what will happen is you will get an rna which is shown here after transcription this is a single molecule now this single molecule will form a hairpin loop what would happen is this would be uh, forming double stranded structure and there will be hairpin loop which will be processed further as i told you uh, by dicer and ris complex so the advantage of creating so you necessarily don't have to have an sh loop containing construct you can have both dsrna that is what i think i showed in my uh, presentation also for example dsrna or hairpin loop rna both will give you to final gene silence now coming to uh, the uh, i hope this is clear so you have a promoter you have a gene the same construct will have the anti sense sequence so when rna polymerase transcribes this the rna will be produced so there will be this white and blue they are uh, complementary to each other so they will form a uh, double stranded loop and dicer will act and then give you small non coding uh, regulatory rna which we call as sir i hope that is clear now i come to the uh, fourth question how are rna protected trna is protected i uh, so the simple answer to this is Th this topic is very difficult to answer uh, so the problem is so simple answer for your uh, question is trna modification stabilizes trns so you have various kinds of modifications which are shown here in black uh, in red and green now uh, why i did not talk about this is that these very structures or modifications are also responsible for trna degradation so uh, that's a separate issue each any molecule biological molecule has to be uh, constantly being synthesized and degraded its process and tirna also trna also plays a role in sirna uh, mediated uh, silencing and those so it becomes very complicated that it is being degraded but it is also stable but suffice to say for at this stage of knowledge uh, for teachers that trna modification stabilizes trnas those of you who are interested in detail about this there are several review articles and uh, excellent uh, research publications just type trna and uh, rnai you will get a series of uh, references uh, the problem with us all uh, as uh, i think dr bhat also mentioned we also mentioned somebody asked why can't we revise the uh, textbook constantly every day or every year or maybe frequently the reason is that somewhere we have to stop and give the students a knowledge base which is required because what i say today would not be relevant tomorrow what i used to learn and what i used to teach periodically i had to revise my statements but as a teacher of a school if you keep on revising you are saying this is also true that is also true the trna modification stabilizes trna but on the contrary somebody says no no these are the modifications which allow it to be degraded then it becomes confusing for you 
so uh, that is why uh, i am always reminded of a cartoon by rk lakshman i show this sometimes uh, before i start a lecture which says uh, ladies and gentlemen to avoid controversy on this very delicate matter let me at the very outset deny the statement i am going to make and that is true for all of us so uh, at that moment we are not lying like in this case it might be but as a uh, uh, teacher we at that time whatever was the knowledge and also in some sometimes we have to hold back that knowledge because if we give all of that together to teachers or students they get confused so once you have understood a principle then those exceptions can always be talked about and discussed that this is what was there for example you have you have heard of central dogma which says dna to rna to protein and uh, then it was reversed so you have reverse transcriptase so you now know that you can get dna from rna and so on so forth so uh, i would stop here unless you have any questions uh, this is the this i think i would uh, stop here is that okay dr bhat <laughs> well it's okay for me uh, uh, are, yeah so maybe uh, from the chat we will know or, uh, whether uh, i i have yeah, to I, no. or if you want to add okay. something please do no no uh, okay. because i had some disruptions in between uh, but uh, there are questions that i would like to flag uh, are you able to hear me yeah yeah go ahead yeah the questions uh, from the previous one again they reappear somehow uh, is that how do we introduce this into tobacco that uh, transformation okay the, the uh, yes. okay so uh, this would and how, how does a, it really no i and i got the uh, so this i have faced when i used to present they would say how would you introduce and when if i say agrobacterium they say we know it but point is that they have not been uh, discussed in detail in the textbook so really for example i saw a question which stage of tobacco do you introduce it in? that was a question so uh, for that you will have to understand the transformation process uh, 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 or how do you introduce any gene into plant there are various methods and uh, i would like to uh, give a separate lecture on them that what is the method so in those cases one takes Uh, help of tissue culture you already know that plant cells are totipotent so a single cell can be regenerated into a whole plant so if you are able to introduce in a cell uh, from let us say if, if you should take a piece of leaf and subject it to transformation few cells of the leaf would have acquired the gene of your interest then these cells which have acquired the gene of your interest can be selected by using selectable marker i think uh, uh dr monica talked about uh, selectable market so you are able to now in those cases she was talking about bacterial selection i will say you can you also have markers for plant selection so you can select a plant which has acquired the gene because it has along with the construct you have the gene for selectable mark so all those cells would 99% will have the gene of your interest so that is and then you subject these cells the leaf disc or leaf cells to uh process of tissue culture to regenerate these selected cells in to give you a whole plant and then you can go through the normal process of uh, crossing and fertilizing so you get uh, progeny of those and get the seeds so that is how you introduce into a plant so when you say we have introduced into plant that means you have introduced into plant and obtained a seed and then it can be propagated to generation so these Uh, rna uh, i constructs which were introduced in tobacco were you done using the same process and then those seeds were collected and those uh, which can the transformation was confirmed and then they were subjected to the infection with uh, melidogain incognita which i had shown yeah uh, i think uh, i'll add a word there yeah, go ahead most often we use the word plant was transformed <laughs> remember a plant will is never transformed a multicellular organism every cell of a multicellular organism cannot be transformed or you cannot introduce gene into every cell basically as dr srinivasan said we start with a tissue culture where individual cell is transformed and those individual transformed cells are regenerated to complete plant so 
the word is a slight misnomer in the sense it is not plant transformation it is plant cell transformation basically and from that plant cell you get the whole plant regenerated through tissue culture uh, there are uh, fresh questions that srinivasan one is is agrobacteria bacterium tumefaciens the only plant genetic engineer and can slide of uh, <laughs> interference okay so, sorry uh, i'll tell you all the three all the three questions can well, slide of rna interference with the help of dicers and risk complex can be explained can you explain uh, i think can, i have already done i don't want to uh, do it i the uh, uh, sim uh, simple is as i said if you want more detail there are uh, places where you can get so if you have these shrna it's acted upon dicer there are n number of other protein Uh, uh, so are required somebody asks what is the nature of dicer dicer is an enzyme it's a ribonuclease so it cuts the rna so uh, um, so there are enzymes there are other proteins associated with with directed there is one thing something called argonaut so the mechanism gets more complex and detailed so suffice to say that these double stranded rnas are acted by what the video said cop so it is rna induced silencing complex if you remember that that's good enough uh, that's also not present in, uh, that's not given in your textbook but still rna induced silencing complex so a complex of several proteins and along with which contains argonauts dicer and everything else directs and at a specific uh, sequence because the sequence the rna if you remember it is chopped off so that sequence is very specific to an mrna so the complex carries that rna as a signature and goes to the complementary one and there again so because there is an enzyme dicer it cuts chops off the mrnas i think i would stop what is the other question what are, there are other transforming agents no what is the other than agrobacterium tumefaciens what is the other engineering there are uh, uh, several methods uh, but three are more prominent one is agrobacterium mediated transformation the other is uh, gene gun as you know biological ballistics or biolistics which is called where you propel uh, small particles micro particles of gold or tungsten coated with the dna into plant cell so it is that is why it's called gun so these uh, uh, particles penetrate the plants and uh, get into lodged into some of the plant cell where the dna is released and incorporated the third is you can transform proto protoplast which is called direct dna uptake so uh, you uh, incubate the protoplast protoplasts are nothing but plant cells devoid of plant cell wall and they take up the dna uh, there you can uh, use a chemical method to facilitate entry of dna or uh, you can use uh, electroporation as it called so uh, a strong uh, short pulses of uh, a change in electricity will help in introduction of these plants so these are one there are others where you can do transformation of flowers in arabidopsis but those are exceptions i don't want to talk people have used nanoparticles people have used other bacteria related to agrobacterium which are belonging to rhizobial uh, strains uh, and developed uh, transformation vectors okay i think uh, that more or less uh, uh, completes all the questions pertaining to this area uh, now we, we can have dr deepak Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I'll share my screen, sir. Yeah. Uh, so good afternoon to all of you. Uh, I'll be talking again on the same topics which I had talked previously, uh, but with some more detail explanation. Uh, so there were several questions related to sudden hybridization that how we go for denaturation of dna why single stranded and how probes are designed and what basically uh, like and then why probes are made single stranded all those things i will cover in detail uh, with some uh, diagrammatic representation so we will start from beginning for sudden hybridization first thing is that you have to digest your dna so this we are doing basically to chop your dna into small small fragments uh now after digest deepak can you go into slide view okay okay is it fine sir yeah 
Okay. Yes. Yes. Uh, so for southern hybridization, uh, what we essentially do is we first digest our genomic DNA uh, by some enzymes so that we can make small small fragments, and then afterwards, like normal electrophoresis, like we do for PCR also. After PCR amplification, we go for electrophoresis. In this case also, we'll go for the electrophoresis. This is basically done to separate your fragments. Because whenever you will, uh, if you directly go for probe hybridization with digested DNA, it won't be of any use. However, if you separate this fragment in a medium, so these fragments will separate it depending on um, their size. The important thing to note here is that uh, this, you will initially you will get a smear, so you won't be able to see any specific amplicons. So, but the purpose is not here to see amplicons here. Our purpose here is only to separate your genomic DNA uh, in a, in a particular media. So now, after the separation of your genomic DNA, as it is in gel, so uh, we have to transfer it, this genomic DNA to uh, just a minute. This is basically how separation is being done. So after this, this genomic DNA has to be uh, denatured. So for uh, denaturing of genomic DNA, we basically uh, first give a treatment of 0.1 molar HCl. So uh, 0.1 molar HCl is basically given to, uh, uh, basically it is not uh, for denaturation, it is given to, uh, to remove purines basically. So it becomes, a pure, uh, means the site has no purine. So what happens when NUH treatment is given, it, uh, it might chop it there. So NUH is basically given for uh, a lysis. So we call it basically uh, uh, denaturation, by, uh, denaturation by using uh, sodium hydroxide. So since this NUH is there, so the pH is, will be alkaline. So we have to make it uh, uh, neutral again. So after this treatment of this gel, we add uh, some like this HCl or something like that, so that the pH can um, become neutral. And uh, after this, this is called treatment. We call this gel treatment. This is basically done to break your DNA into small, small, further small fragments and to denature your DNA. So after denaturation, because this, uh, this gel is very fragile, very brittle, so it cannot be directly used for uh, hybridization of probe. So that's why uh, we want to fix these bands. So the only way to fix these bands is, or fix these amplicons is, to transfer these amplicons from this uh, uh, agrose gel into some membrane. We have different kinds of membrane. It depends upon uh, your choice also, and the availability also, uh, because they vary in the cost also. So membrane is nothing but a piece of paper. So these bands has to transfer to membrane first, so that you can fix those bands to a solid media. It's, gel is not a solid media. You cannot go treat it further. So while doing so, um, everything will be like um, gel will break and you won't get anything. So it is always desirable, not desirable basically. It is uh, the protocol itself that you have to transfer these amplicons once the, the gel is treated with NOH and then after, uh, after uh, uh, making the pH normal, these bands has to transfer to a particular membrane. So the first question was that what we use for uh, denaturing. So we use NUH and this NUH basically denature your DNA. Now the transfer is uh, nothing but it is uh, a simple mechanism that you might have noticed uh, in your homes also. Like when we go for this capillary, capillary kind of thing, capillary action is there whenever you put a thread in water. So after some time you will see the water will exudate out at the tip of those thread. The same thing is happening here also. So if suppose, if, uh, now this is basically a design of uh, the transfer, how it is essentially transferred. So we have a buffer. In this buffer, we put a tray. Uh, above the tray, we put a stack of filter papers. Filter papers are basically placed because they are very porous. So uh, they make a capillary tube. So that's why we put a stack of filter papers. We can put sponge also. And after that stack of filter paper, next we put our gel. So and immediately above that gel, we have to put a blotting paper. Uh, we have to put a, this uh, uh, our um, paper in which we want to transfer. Suppose a membrane, we can say, like nitrocellulose membrane or something like that. And then again, we can put blotting paper. Then we have to put a glass cover so that to uh, uh, to give it weight basically, so that everything doesn't move, everything is fixed. So I'll I'll, I'll tell this, this again. This is basically a simple capillary action. We have a buffer tank. 
and that buffer tank we put a tray above that tray we put some a stack of filter paper or blotting papers we can put sponge also and then after that blotting paper blotting paper essentially what blotting paper is doing it is providing that capillary uh, action the capillary tubes are being formed because it is porous uh, the blotting paper is porous after that blotting paper we put our gel the gel which has been pre treated with uh, different uh, compounds and the dna in this gel is broken into small small fragment and also made single stranded after that gel we put a membrane immediately above that gel we have to put a membrane because what will happen while the buffer will start moving due to the capillary action it will move your dna also it will move your dna out from the gel and eventually because that membrane is exactly above uh, above your gel so it will go and bind to your that membrane and membrane have some specific uh, Uh, groups in which your DNA binds. So, and then again, you have this blotting papers, and then you have a weight. So, this is how the transfer is being done. This is by capillary action, where the DNA is transferred to membrane. There are other methods also. We have vacuum blot also. In that case, we don't use this capillary in all those things. We provide vacuum, and by, um, by that vacuum only, this DNA will move to your membrane. So now, I told you why it is done because you wanted to fix your DNA. to a particular membrane so that it is stabilized now this membrane it is quite stable dna is uh, permanently bound to that membrane now this membrane can subsequently be treated with uh, uh, or um, treated with different chemicals for further downstream uh, processes now uh, so after the uh, this transfer of dna to your membrane there is another step we call it cross linking this is nothing but because the dna has been transferred as i told you earlier also this membrane have some specific groups so this dna will bound to those groups and uh, that reaction is being catalyzed by a uv so we called it uv cross linking so by uv cross linking this membrane gets bound to your dna now once this dna is being fixed on your membrane the next aspect of southern hybridization is you have to design probes so probes are basically nothing but they are there are they are a piece of dna which are labeled with some uh, some chemicals you can easily imagine here now we have uh, something uh, uh, previously we used to re uh, label them but now we have this uh, uh, different dyes also so for time being you can imagine that we are labeling this probe with some specific dye say for instance i'll label this uh, probe with some dye which is green in color so probe is basically a piece of dna and that probe has to labeled and after labeling that probe has to be made single stranded see why single stranded because your uh, your membrane your dna in the membrane is also single stranded and probe is also single stranded it will go and bind to your dna if it is in double stranded form it it won't have uh, the open atgcs so it won't be able to bind your dna so that's why in this case also we make a single stranded probe now after this probe labeling and designing what we do we go for hybridization so hybridization with what we have that dna with us in that membrane dna is being fixed there to that dna which is being present in the membrane we can add this labeled probe so in this case the probe is already labeled but and then again you can think of some color say i say I, i'll say it is labeled by some yellow color so what will happen when i'll see or visualize this entire membrane which is being hybridized with your probe i'll be able to see some specific bands some specific amplicons wherever the probe will bind so this is basically your hybridization by we have different methods of capturing this binding we can capture by uh, this uh, uh, x rays also we can uh, capture by some uh, like now we have this uh, different labeling method so there are different image capturing devices also by which we, by which we can capture this so this is uh, how we do this uh, uh, southern hybridization now i'll move to i hope this is clear to all of you uh, if you have any doubts we can discuss it more uh, 
Yes, Deepak, uh, uh, I would like you to slightly elaborate on probe because there are lots of people have difficulty with the probe. How do you select what is a probe? Okay. Uh, just you can take some concrete example yes, as to what you want to detect. Okay. Uh, Fine, sir. Fine. So uh, basically, uh, this southern hybridization technique, uh, now we are using it for different purpose. But before this PCR came, the hybridization was routinely done when we uh, when we see when we want to check uh, the presence or absence of some DNA fragments or more specifically gene in organism which are not yet uh, sequenced or no DNA information was there. For instance, I'll give an example. Mice is a model system. So initial all the molecular biology experiments were I were either in mice or in guinea pig or in some uh, bacteria or in case of plant we have model system Arabidopsis and all those things. Uh, but uh, so mice I'll take for time being mice. So because it was extensively studied, so in all these uh, experiments, some DNA information or information of some genes were known. Some sequence was available and all those things was done. Now, for instance, if a gene uh, that is present in mice has been identified by some means, but at that time we were not having this human genome information. But if I wish to check whether that gene, which is present in mice also, is also present in humans. So for that purpose, this is a very straightforward approach. So only what we have to do is that. So in this case, our probe is basically the gene from the mice because we wanted to check whether that piece of DNA is present in humans or not. So I'll take an example of a gene for hearing. So if a gene for uh, uh, any pathway, like gene for deafness was uh, identified in mice first. So if a gene for hearing is identified in mass, ma mice, which is uh, um, known by different experiment that it might play an important role in hearing. And whenever the gene is being mutated, the mice become deaf. So this was, this was, this we know already. So now this gene we can take because we have sequence information, but in case of humans, we were not knowing uh, any such kind of, any gene of such kind was not known. So what to do? We will straight away, we'll take the gene of mice. And because we know that there are uh, the genes which are very important uh, in normal metabolism or normal growth, they are conserved throughout uh, genera. Normally they are conserved, not always, but they are conserved like the genes which are involved in, uh, let's say, uh, glycolysis and all those pathways, the genes are more or less conserved. So because hearing is also an important process, so the gene might be conserved. So if I wanted to check that gene, I label it with some uh, labeling molecule. And this is our probe now. And human DNA, we will follow the same process. Process. We will go for digestion. We will go for transfer to a blotting paper. Uh, sorry, to a membrane, and that membrane will now we will hybridize that membrane with the probe which we have taken from mice. So this is uh, why we used to do southern hybridization. Now, in case of plant biology, we do southern hybridization for detection of copy number and all those things. But I think that the easiest easiest way to understand uh, hybridization is uh, from the example I told you about mice and humans. I hope, sir, it is. Uh, well, there, there is a slight uh, this one. The, how are sequence of the bases determined in the probe? Probe is basically a piece of DNA, which you synthesize. See, if you want to label, here he has shown P32 as a label. How do you cannot label the one piece of DNA that you have taken? It has to be labeled during replication. So you do a, basically a PCR taking that and include the P32 labels, uh, labeled nucleotides, so that those nucleotides are labeled. I think you, you can elaborate a bit on that. Okay. So uh, as I rightly said, there are different methods of labeling also, although uh, sir is very right that we use PCR for labeling, but then again, we have different enzymes also, like polyribonucleotide, uh, this uh, kinase is there. Don't right. go into complications. Take only one simple. P32 labeling is given in their books. P32 labeling, uh, we can add by this kinase also. And the labeling, we called it. So if we have the, if PCR option is not there, we can directly label that uh, DNA fragment which we are having with us by providing some uh, phosphate that is being labeled with some radio label nucleotide, radio label uh, 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 this uh, phosphorus. And this phosphorus, now the kinase, what it will do, it will directly go and add that uh, radio label phosphorus at the end of your 
DNA. So this is also a way how we can label. And well, PCI is a um, best method because in that case, you add this labeled uh, phosphorus throughout the length of the fragment. So if you have higher uh, in density of this radio label phosphorus, the intensity is also good. Otherwise, if we don't have, if, if we are not knowing sequence information, so if sequence is not known, we, can, we can't go for PCR. So you can end label your uh, fragments. So this is how it can be done. Is it okay? Clear? Okay, okay, okay. Okay, so I'll, 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 I'll move. Uh, yeah, please move. Now this is uh, the representation of the entire cartoon, which I showed you in the previous slides. The first thing what is done is that your DNA that is being separated in agarose ejectophoresis is transferred to a membrane. As I told you previously also, we have different types of membrane. It depends on availability, funding also, and all those things and a stability of membrane also. Once the DNA is being transferred to membrane, that DNA is hybridized to a probe and probes are labeled. So only those fragments of DNA which are hybridized to your probes will be detected by your uh, imaging system. So this is the uh, summary of Southern hybridization. Now polymerase chain reaction, uh, I, uh, I explained in previous lecture also, but there was some doubt here so uh, I'll try to make it clear uh, how this PCR goes on. So as I told you previously, you cannot amplify your entire genome. For amplification of, uh, in PCR, what basically we are doing, we are amplifying a specific fragment of your DNA for which primers can be designed. Without primers, we cannot amplify a fragment. So then again, question comes that if the, if the sequence is not known uh, from where we can take primers. So primers can be taken from heterologous system from where you can easily design primers based on the sequence. Say for instance, if I wanted to amplify a gene in humans, uh, and then I can take from the sequence of a closely related organism that you can amplify. And also in PCR, uh, like I told in previous lecture also, if you have, a, we have human genome information for a a reference individual, not every individual has been sequenced, but we know that we all are entirely uh, different. So that from that reference genome, we can take primer, we can design primers. And suppose if I want to do a study in uh, study related to my genome, and I wanted to uh, see that uh, whether, what is the sequence of the gene that I am having as, and I wanted to compare with the reference genome. So I can take uh, that uh, sequence from reference genome, and then I can isolate my DNA and amplify my, my DNA with those specific primers. So this is uh, the most important things. Without primer, we cannot amplify a piece of DNA. Now the question here was that, uh, as this uh, figure is shown here, but I showed that when the primer binds to your strands, it is not like that. It will terminate at the end of your strand. Although it is shown like the the ends of fragment is being shown here. It seems like it is terminating here, but in the first cycle, it won't terminate here. Termination will depend on the polymerase, which is being added. So it might go up to say uh, uh, 2 KB or 2000 bases or 3000 bases. Anywhere it can terminate, it is entirely a random process. So in the first cycle, see in this case, cycle one, you can see here, we have a double standard DNA after denaturation, annealing is there. Two primers, are, two primers are, I'll just. So we have this primer one, forward primer and reverse primer. So after the first cycle of denaturation, two primer will bind to their respective strands. And then extension will proceed in the presence of a polymerase, which will go and adding bases based on the information of the uh, template strand. Now it is not like that, that it will terminate at the end of this uh, primer two, as you can see, although in this figure, it seems like it is terminating, but it won't terminate like this. It will go on and it is a random process. It might terminate after thousand bases or 3000 bases. It, it, it all depends on polymerase. So after first, first cycle, what we are getting basically is, is this like we have two copies, but these two copies are not specific. 
from second cycle onwards we will get specific copies see how in this case we get specific copies we have to imagine a little bit this is the fragment of first copy uh, of first cycle first fragment of first cycle and this is the second fragment of second cycle it will again go in the same process as i showed in the previous uh, cycle like again denaturation renaturation so these two fragment this black one and this black one is basically coming from your first cycle now you see only this right now so what will happen now because again the primer will bind so in this black one the same thing which happened in the first cycle it will happen in this in this black one also however the red strand which was synthesized in the first cycle now in this case the green primer will bind because it is complemented to the this green primer so it will go on extending this a red fragment also but in this case you have this end because it was synthesized from here only and similarly for this green strand also this in the second cycle you will get specific amplicons because they will terminate to a specific end so from second cycle onwards you will get specific products and a non specific also and because from in this third cycle again again you will get non specific products but in this case your specific products will increase exponentially how will it remain it will only give a single copy after each cycle so this is a little bit difficult to understand because once you start making this in a copy it will become very easy to understand uh so uh i hope uh, and, and at the end of this pcr cycle you will get 2 to the power n n is basically your uh, starting copies and 2 basically why 2 because at every cycle you are getting two products so at the end of this uh, cycle 35 for if i say if i go for a pcr reaction for 35 cycles so i can say that from a single copy 2 to the power 35 copies will be made i'll just again and touch this because uh, sir is it clear or shall i yeah, yeah. okay 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 i'll move forward from this uh, i'll try to make an, a very uh, a different video for this uh, uh, if possible in next uh, sessions or in next lectures i'll surely make a video for this so that it becomes quite easy to understand now dna sequencing dna sequencing i told you uh, in previous lecture also so before sequencing this is what this is exactly how replication occurs i told you there also that this 3 prime oh this is your this is your 3 prime oh so this is basically a base deoxy adenosine triphosphate so why deoxy because at 2 prime this is 2 prime this is 1 this is 3 this one is 3 so since it is not having this hydroxyl group at 2 prime position so we called it deoxy deoxy adenosine triphosphate this 3 prime oh has a very important role in sequencing so why this 3 prime oh uh, sorry in replication this 3 prime oh is having a very important role why because if this 3 prime oh by a specific chemical reaction it will act on the uh, the the phosphate group of the incoming base and finally it will this phos by this phosphodiester bond this two adenosine uh, phosphate basically in this case or two bases will be connected ribose uh, base will be connected by this phosphodiester bond and then again a free 3 prime oh will be there so that the next incoming base the same reaction can occur and likewise the sequence can go on and the entire strand can be synthesized so why i showed it here because this 3 prime oh is really very important without this 3 prime oh this reaction won't go further so if you have this kind of situation where this 3 prime hydroxyl is missing so we called it d di deoxy so why di deoxy as this 2 prime is also missing and this 3 prime is also missing so it is a di deoxy base so so we call these di deoxy bases 
or triphosphatase nucleotide triphosphate as terminator why terminator because this oh is not there the free oh is not there so it won't act on the phosphorus of incoming base so the reaction won't be catalyzed and the reaction will terminate here itself so that's why these bases are used for so in, in sequencing we use this dideoxy nucleotide triphosphate is triphosphate bases and we call it terminators sequence terminators so for simplicity i have shown only two reactions how sanger sequencing goes on but in next slide i have this uh, entire uh, entire setup that how this sequence is being uh, determined so this is the case is an actual experiment where you can i think it will be very uh, easy for you to understand if you go and write all this thing in a pen and a paper you make exactly the same thing which i have mentioned here and you go on expanding on the basis of the bases which are present in your template strand made make a strand on the basis of this template strand say for instance i take we have to set up four reactions for every sequencing experiment we have to set up four reactions these four reactions are similar except for the addition of this dideoxy terminator in each tube you will add all these four bases datp these are normal deoxy adenosine triphosphate deoxy cytosine triphosphate likewise these are normal bases there is no terminator we add this dideoxy terminator also why four because in four different tubes we can add four different dideoxy terminators now if i take example of this tube and if you understand this tube one you can easily make tube 2 tube 3 and tube 4 so in this tube one i have added my dna sequence dna uh, fragment that has to be sequenced and with that fragment these bases are also added these normal bases are also added and then a very small amount of dideoxy atp is also added now the first thing what is to what you need to remember here is that we are adding a small amount of dd ntp dd in this case dd atp ntp is for atgc everything we write it n but in this case where you are adding a small amount now why very small amount so if i add this dd atp if the concentration of this dd atp is more than this normal datp so for instance you imagine this at first instance if the concentration of dideoxy atp is more than this normal atp so what will happen so so every reaction will terminate at this point i'll explain it again in this case what we have done we have added all the normal bases and apart from all these bases we have this small amount of dd atp so so first we will take if what what will happen a very small amount is added so a very small amount is added so there are three different possibilities that the strand which is being synthesized can terminate at three different places the first place is that first place is this one why this one because when the strand, when the strand will be synthesized the first base is c so g will be added so now the first base second is t so corresponding to t in the strand that is being synthesized a will be added so if this added a is dideoxy atp so what will happen your chain will terminate here now second possibility is that if at the second position normal a is added so what will happen your strand will further proceed it won't terminate at the first a it will go on and at the seventh position you again have t in this template strand so corresponding to this t again a will added so the reaction will terminate here likewise the last base is also t to so the synthesizing the strand which is being synthesized a will be added at the last bases and reaction will terminate here so now why it is important why i said small amount so if we add datp in the amount which is more than the normal atp normal uh, di uh, normal deoxy adenosine bases 
So this bases, which are deoxy, I'll from this point onwards, I'll say normal bases. And this I'll call terminator, DDATP as a terminator. So if I add a terminator, which is more as comparable to the normal base, so what will happen? All reaction will terminate here. It won't proceed because the chances are there that at every time, whenever the polymerase tries to add A on this first base, that first T, which has been encountered while synthesizing, it will add your dideoxy base because the concentration is very high. But what will happen if I reduce the concentration to a very small amount? So in that case, there are chances that in the first instance, the normal base can also be incorporated and there are chances that your terminator can also be incorporated. So if the concentration of this dideoxy terminator is 10 times less than DATP, so it means that the chances of getting this time, this kinds of fragment, this kind of, that means if, so if the concentration of this uh, DATP is basically, is less than your normal basis, so there are chances that you will get this uh, three different bases. And you, you will also get this, but this means this is basically a complete sequence where no terminators has been incorporated. Means a complete sequence. You will obviously get this sequence where this terminator has not been incorporated. But and in that in this tube you will have this product. But in this case we have labeled this ATP. So what will happen? Only those fragments which are having this terminator A will be detected. In this case, you don't have this terminator A. So labeling is not there, so it won't be detected. So it means that every fragment, those which are having the end base as a terminator, and in this case, A as a terminator, so they will be detected. So when we load this product of this tube one, in the electrophoresis. So what will happen? We will get two different bands of three different sizes. And these bands, these amplicons in this case, we can, I can write A corresponding to these amplicons. Why it is so? Because I know that, the, that if I'm getting any amplicon in this tube one, this the end of this amplicon will have A. So I'll write it A corresponding to this first amplicon. Amplicon from this tube one. Likewise, if I go for tube number two, so in this case also, we'll add a very small amount of DCTP. So by adding this small amount of terminator, there are, we'll get two different product along with this complete one also because I said in previous thing, uh, previous uh, explanation also that because uh, this is in very small amount. So we'll get this normal amplicon also, but in normal amplicon, again, no labeled base has been incorporated. So it won't be detected, but there are possibility that we will get this amplicon of two different sizes. When you will write this, you will, in a paper, you will easily understand why, why you are getting these two bases. And then these two amplicons basically, because in this first case, the first base, first G is at fifth position. So the C can be incorporated up at the 15th position. And in this case at uh, 19th position. So, so again, in this case, you will get two amplicons. I can write a C corresponding to this particular amplicons. So this is for two tubes. Now, if I go on uh, writing this or expanding this to all the tubes. So this is how exactly what you will get. In every tube, you will get the complete amplicon also. Just to uh, remind you, in every tube, the complete amplicon is also there because anyway, you are adding all these normal bases you are adding this all these normal bases also, but since these base star normal bases are not labeled, the fragments will not be detected in your 
electrophoresis. So these four tubes are there with four different dideoxy terminators. And in every tube, you will get amplicon of different, different sizes. And more importantly, no two amplicons can be of same size. This you can easily figure out why it is possible, why it is so. Because when you will try to make amplicons from this particular uh, fragment that is given to you, you will easily notice that all the fragments are of different, different sizes. And that, that is exactly, uh, uh, the, exactly what is the basis of this uh, sequencing uh, process. Now, in tube number two, two, we get two amplicons. We can write C corresponding to the, these amplicons. In the same way, in the tube number four, we can write G because all the end bases are G. So now, by writing the corresponding bases, you will get this kind of sequence like A, G, C. And if I make a complement of this, so what will happen? Complement is basically why I'm making this because I wanted to represent my sequence in, in from five prime to three prime direction. So this is basically your uh, representation. If I make a complement of this, so I'll get this sequence. And now you can easily see, this is your sequence, C, T, A, C. This is exactly what we sequence. So in this way, uh, you can use Sanger sequencing for uh, sequencing a specific fragment of DNA. This you can only understand if you go and write, you can take a photograph of this from your mobile phone and you can exactly go and make a diagram of this. Once you make like this, it will become very easy for you to understand. So I'll stop here, sir. Uh, I hope uh, if any questions are there, then. Okay, okay, that's fine. Uh, I do not see any questions. Uh, so with that, we'll come to the, we'll come to the end of this uh, session of presentations. Uh, there is one question which I had promised that we will take up. Uh, which I will answer. Uh, the question, again, it's a recurring question. Uh, even it was answered earlier uh, in the previous day, but somehow there is a lingering doubt about uh, this. The question is, the satellite DNA, satellite chromosome. Uh, this was explained earlier. Let me tell you first about the satellite chromosome. Satellite chromosome, uh, you might have seen in your textbooks of uh, describing mitosis, where the, the mitotic chromosomes, particularly metaphase, uh, we find constriction uh, in the chromosome, particularly one is at the centromere, because centromeres do not take stain. So there is a constriction uh, of chromosome. There is, in some chromosomes, we also find constriction apart from the centromere. As a result, there again appears a break and again a, a piece of uh, chromosome uh, corresponding position. So this sort of uh, appearance is called a satellite because you have a main chromosome and a bit of it is present further away. Uh, you can see a small gap in between. That is what is called constriction, secondary constriction, because primary constriction is centromere. So that is called a satellite chromosome. Why this happens? Because that particular region uh, contains rRNA genes, several copies of rRNA genes, uh, which are also actively transcribed. That is why that does not take stain and gives rise to this satellite chromosomes, what we see. Uh, so I think that should rest the question about satellite chromosome. Satellite DNA is yet another, uh, because the words are used are common. Uh, satellite is what? Satellite is something we have, a moon as a satellite of Earth. So similarly, there also, there is a one main thing and something that is next to it, uh, perhaps uh, in some way uh, associated with it. I won't call it is not necessarily linked, but associated. Uh, so what is that in the case of satellite DNA? When you do a total DNA extraction, 
and centrifuge it, uh, what happens is in ultra centrifuge, the DNA will separate and accumulate at a particular density uh, in the tube. So in the ultra centrifugation, people have noticed that there is a main band of DNA and that is a smaller uh, band slightly above, uh, which is slightly lighter. That means uh, you will find a main and a satellite. That is how the satellite DNA came about. Uh, and again, that satellite DNA generally contains repetitive sequences. Uh, that is why it has a different set, slightly different uh, density as compared to the main band, which contains uh, different types of DNA of from derived from all parts of the chromosomes. So this is what is the difference between satellite, satellite chromosome and the third place again, where uh, this satellite comes is micro satellite, mini satellites, and uh, those sort of things, which Dr. Singh also explained. I think with these, the confusion about satellite DNA, satellite chromosome, uh, and other things should be, you know, resolved. If not, do right first. We will try to really help you uh, further clarify on this point. Uh, with this, uh, we come to the end of this webinar series. I would like to thank all the participants as well as the resource persons and this morning's special guests, uh, Dr. A.K. Singh and Dr. Mahapatra. Uh, we are extremely grateful to you for sparing your time to be with us today and to the resource persons throughout the whole week. And uh, I also thank uh, Dr. Berman, who has been providing the anchor from behind and recording all the information and also providing us the complete uh, details of the chats as well as question answers, which we will take it and make it an archive and again go through those uh, so that we can design further lectures uh, as per the needs of the teachers. Uh, I think uh, I also thank all the participants for enthusiastically participating, not only hearing, but also putting lots of questions, because this is how we can clarify and improve uh, our understanding. And I'm sure uh, you will all appreciate the efforts that uh, Mrs. Lakshmi has been providing. In fact, she is the via media. Uh, otherwise, most of us do not know the teachers. Uh, she is the one who provides all the background and sets up all the conversations with various teachers. Uh, we'll shortly be having our own websites. And after that, I think we'll have much more uh, regular communication. Uh, with this, I wish to thank all of you and uh, if there are any shortcomings, please let us know. We'll try to improve and we would like to help you. And in turn, we would like to realize the dreams of Professor Chopra, who wanted that uh, this trust should be really working at the grassroots level. And also, I thank our chairman, Professor M.S. Swaminathan, who has been uh, helping us uh, and also encouraging us on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, we, the last announcement is we have promised you that we would like to uh, distribute certificates, e-certificates to you. Uh, we have contacted Dr. Swaminathan because of the lockdown and his uh, advanced age. He said he will send his sign to this one. Disruption. Uh, with this, uh, all participants and 